uh, before I um, go into that, uh, the f first exam is on Friday. And the topics are everything up through strain and constitutive relationship. Um, okay, number 18, you have it with you? Yes. Okay, number 18. Uh, so we have a cube. All the side lengths are one centimeter. One meter. Point oh one meters, I mean. Point oh one meter. Um, and it's deformed in vertical tension, so we're applying a force like this and this. Uh, the resulting shape is shown below. It's going to, if you apply a force here and here, it's going to stretch it. And if you stretch it this way, it's going to uh, contract that way. So you're going to end up with something taller and thinner. That's obviously exaggerated, but, well. You know, something like that. Uh, and this thing, it's a rectangle. And this length is um, 0 0.00999. And the height is point zero one zero zero five meters um, and the load well we need to know the load oh what's Poisson's ratio okay so first what's Poisson's ratio Poisson's ratio is defined as, um, so if you make the x-axis go along the loaded direction, so that's x, that's y. Poisson's ratio is negative um, epsilon offload axis divided by epsilon along the loaded axis. Um, And so we need to figure out what these are. Epsilon XX is um, 0 0.01005 minus 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.01. Can someone calculate that? Five times ten to the five. It's five. I think that's five times ten to the minus third. You're like, no, we're not doing it. Do it in your head, motherfucker. Uh, and then epsilon y y is uh, point. Zero zero nine 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 minus point zero one divided by point zero one. Will you calculate that one for me? Negative one times ten to the minus third. Uh, 
And so Poisson's ratio is negative of negative 1 times 10 to the minus 3rd divided by 5 times 10 to the minus 3rd, so positive 0.2. Poisson's ratio always has to be positive, so. Is that a possible number? What are the limits of the possible range? 0 to 0.5, yep. And 0.5 means what? That's, that's right. Uh, 0.5, yeah, it means that the volume stays the same. All that changes is the shape of that constant volume. Okay. Oh, uh, yes, because it's under pressure. That's right. The pressure can change, but not the, not the volume. That's true, too. Right. Yes. That's true. <laughs> That'd be funny to give it. No, let's give it a more accurate name. Let's give this a more accurate name. Excuse me, I'm allowed to listen to my radio at a reasonable volume. Um, what's the deformed length of the cube parallel to the z-axis? How do we do this one? How do we know this one? So the thing is, whether you look in the y direction or the z direction, the Poisson ratio is the same. So now that we know that the Poisson's ratio is 0.2, we know that 0.2 is also equal to negative uh, epsilon zz over epsilon xx. And so that means that epsilon zz has to be the same as yy. This has to be negative 1 times 10 to the minus 3rd. Um, and so negative 1 times 10 to the minus 3rd is equal to L minus, uh, this is a cube, so um, 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.01. Those that started out as different lengths, we could go through this calculation and get L. But what you have here is two different side lengths that are the same, you know, uh, and they have the same strain, so the deformed length has to be the same. So uh, L is equal to uh, oh, I use a different coordinate system in the problem. That's okay. If you wanted, you could, so, uh, no, you couldn't really. Right, right. But there is a coordinate system given on the problem, and it doesn't match what I'm using, but uh, if, it doesn't matter. Okay, so L is equal to uh, 0 0.9, no. 0 0.00999 meters. Okay, so now for part C, if the same cube is compressed vertically, uh, so the side parallel to the y-axis has a length of 0.9, that's, uh, okay, so now this same material is compressed like this, and I don't know why I use this number. Uh, so let's say this is 0.9, um, and we want to calculate this. I'll call this L Y. Um, so why is that? A strange number to use. Uh, yes, you're right. 
<laughs> well, it's still going to be strange, but that would make it a lot stranger, yes. Uh, the you know, strain is going to be huge compared to the kind of strains that are reasonable for any kind of engineering material. So this is uh, not realistic. This is just sort of a mathematical problem. Um, Okay, so uh, we know that Poisson's ratio is equal to negative strain yy over strain xx. Um, the strain in the x direction is 0 0.009 minus 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.01. So that is 1, 2, 3, 1 times 7 minus 3rd. That's 0.1. That's way out of the reasonable range for these approaches. Okay, so Poisson's ratio, we know that's equal to 0.2, and that's equal to negative epsilon yy divided by 0 0.1. So um, uh, this is negative, sorry. And so epsilon yy is equal to 0 0.02. So is that uh, getting longer or contracting? Yep, that's getting longer because it's positive. Um, and epsilon yy is equal to, you know, that's 0 0.2 is equal to L y minus 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.01. So L y is equal to uh, let's see, what is that? 0 0.0002. So 0 0.0102, is that right? OK. Uh, OK, and then same thing in the z direction, because you'd go through the same approach and nothing would change. You'd still have the same initial length of one centimeter. So LZ is also equal to 0 0.0102. Um, then D, it gives you a Young's modulus of 90 gigapascals. So that's 90 times 10 to the 9 pascals. Uh, and the compliance matrix is just this, this matrix. Hopefully you have that programmed in. Uh, but you'll get values according to that Poisson's ratio and that Young's modulus. Um, And uh, given that compliance matrix, what's the stress tensor that you have if the result is the strain matrix from part C? Um, well, you know that the stress, the Voigt stress, 
is equal to the stiffness matrix times the Voigt strain, or in other words, the compliance matrix inverse times the Voigt strain. Um, so what do we know about the Voigt strain? Uh, the XX strain in C is negative 0.1. The YY and ZZ are 0 0.02. Uh, there aren't any angle changes. These are just normal deformations, and so all the shear strains are zero. So multiply that vector with the inverse of the compliance matrix that you found in D, and you'll get the, the void stress. And it asks for the tensor. So then you just have to put it in the tensor form after that. Um, this, there is no material in the world that is linearly elastic with strains this big. There are materials that have strains that big, rubber and, you know, flat, there are lots of things, but there, there's not a linear relationship between stress and strain in those kind of materials. So there's, there's no, uh, setting in the world where it would be reasonable to take strains this big and multiply it by a by a stiffness matrix, but mathematically you can do it. You know. Um, and I was going to say something. Who knows? Uh, any other questions about that one, Ulysses? Okay. Anybody have any questions on that? So yes, we know the Poisson's ratio. Oh, I know what I was going to ask. Okay, so uh, what do we know about the... Um, what do we know about the shape of the... Uh, let's just say everything we can figure out from looking at this about the Voigt stress that's going to come out of this. What do we know? Um, well, uh, we know that it's a uniaxial compression. I guess we knew that from the problem setup. So we're going to have a non-zero value for the xx stress. Is it going to be positive or negative? Negative, because it's compressive. Zero, zero. And then uh, the form of the compliance and the stiffness matrix, when you get into these shear elements, is you just have in the stiffness or compliance, uh, well, what I was going to say is that all you have in the stiffness or compliance matrix are those diagonal elements. Everything else is zero. And so if you have zeros here, you're going to have zeros for the shear stresses, which makes sense if you imagine this thing staying in a rectangular shape. You know, no angles are um, changing, so you wouldn't expect there to be any shear stresses. Um, so the bottom three are zero, no shear. That's right. Yep. So if it's cut in half, there's no cut in half. So if, yeah, if, um, so it can be a little hard to just eyeball this and figure out what's going on. We had a really simple case, so we could sort of do it. But with these, there's this interplay between all the normal stresses and the normal strains because of the Poisson's effect, you know? So one normal stress can lead to three normal strains or vice versa, okay? Um, you know, like, on the other hand, if this strain only had one element of, say it only had a normal strain here, 
when we calculated the stresses, we'd get stresses here and here. And that's also because of the Poisson's effect. But if you don't have any shear strains, you don't have any shear stresses and vice versa. There's no like, uh, there's no like Poisson's effect for shears. Any other homework questions? Okay, um, I wanna do one more example. So back to, um, objects loaded like stress elements. Uh, the most important cases of these are um, when you have just normal stresses, that's when this comes up the most. Uh, it's pretty unusual that you would have uniformly distributed shear stresses occurring on a thing. So, um, and of the cases where you have normal stresses, the most important of those is uh, uniaxial tension or compression. So let's do a case like that and we'll get a little static uh, review. Okay, so let's say that we have this structure um, that's made out of beams like this. So I beam shapes. And they're configured in a thing like this. So this is a rectangular plate. And that rectangular plate There's another one too. Uh, so this other plate is like this. Um, and these things are bolted in like this. And the other one goes this way. You know what I'm trying to get at here? Yes. Right. Right. Yeah, right. That's right. So these two things here are gusset plate and my vision's not that good. Yes, right, that's right. So yeah, it turns out if you build a highway bridge and you make these too thin, eventually cars fall into the river. <laughs> um, Okay, so, and we have loads being applied to the tops of these. I had a kid in one of my classes, like, uh, I had a class where, like, on the anniversary of that, I mentioned something in class, and the kid was like, yeah, I've, me and my friend went into the river. And I'm like, I'm like, he told this crazy story. I wasn't really sure if I believed him or not. And then he, like, <laughs> later in the class, he, like, brought his computer over and he's like, check it out. And there's like a picture of 
him like all days, like talking to a reporter covered in white dust with like his shirt ripped off and just like <laughs> catching this reporter, like, holy Jesus. But he came out fine. They just rode their car right into the, all the way down into the river and, and didn't, neither of them got injured. It's incredible. Uh, okay, so, and we'll say that the setup looks like this. You have a force here of 10,000 Newtons. And uh, we'll make the lengths of both of these one meter. This one too. And uh, what we want to do is calculate stresses in each of these beams. Um, and we need to know also the uh, cross-sectional area. So let's say that the cross-sectional area is uh, let's say it's 0 0.1 meter okay so a couple things to say about this um, Each of these would have a weight, right? Uh, I mean, the way I have it set, set up right now, you can treat it like a truss. Uh, each of these two would have a weight. Uh, but you can leave the weight out of the calculation if that weight is going to be small compared to, compared to the um, other loads that are applied. In this case, I guess we would have a volume of 1 times 0 0.1, so 0 0.1 meters cubed. Uh, 0.1 meters cubed is, so actually, let's, let's get this up to 100,000. So now this force applied is a lot bigger than the weights of either of these two. If it was only 10,000 newtons, they would be sort of in the same order of magnitude. Then we'd have to deal with the weights. And what about dealing with the weights? Does that... You think that would be important or like, I, I mean, say it was important to include calculating the weights. Would that make it a lot harder to do the calculation? I sort of want to talk about this stuff because I know everybody here took statics from someone, you know, not everyone took the same statics class. Uh, um, so if we included the weights in here, we would not, so anybody who spent a lot of time working on the truss simplification, and you know, I know that's a big thing in a lot of statics classes, you can't use the truss simplification if you include the weights of the members, okay? A truss, the truss simplification requires that there are only two forces acting on every member, okay? And so if you have a weight here, let's think about this one. There'd be a force, a reaction force here, a reaction force here, and a third force in the middle, and you wouldn't be able to do that. So being able to use the truss simplification always means that weight is neglected. Okay. Um, the people who took statics with me, we didn't really emphasize that so much. So like the way we did every problem is the way we do every problem, and it wouldn't really make a difference. Um, so, okay. Let's go through this calculation, assuming that there's a neglect of weight. And I want to do this calculation both ways.
we can use the truss simplification because each beam is a two-force member. Okay, so I'm going to go through it first the way that I did it, and then I'll go through it like the truss simplification, and uh, we'll get the same answers, but you can use whichever one you like. Um, so I'm going to choose a numbering. I'll call this body one, this body two, joint A, B, and C. And first, I'm going to uh, isolate body one. Um, so down here, there's a reaction force. I'll call this the reaction at A. And then up at the top, we have to decide somehow, you know, use some uh, system for deciding uh, whether we're going to consider the pin to be connected to body one or body two. Uh, in my class, I just always use the lowest numbered member, so that's what I'm going to do here. So we're going to assume that the pin is part of body one. Um, and so... What's being applied, where are their force is applied to the pin? Um, there's the 100,000 Newton force. And then uh, body two is also in contact with that pin. So there's also going to be a force on body one by body two. And um, let's choose this as the about point for the moment equation. So I'll just write this out as a bookkeeping thing. If this is the about point, what's the row vector to get from the about point to where F12 is applied? Zero, yep. So the row vector is 0, 0. The force vector is F12 X, F12Y. Cross product is 0. Then the 100,000 Newton force, that's at the same place, so it's the same row vector. Uh, the force is 0, negative 100,000. No moment. And then RA. Um, so the vector that we need, the row vector, goes from here to here. Uh, so that would be um, uh, negative 0.5. Negative 0.866. That's an equilateral triangle, so this has to be 60 degrees. The force vector is RAX, RAY. And then the moment is negative 0.5 RAY plus. 0.866 R-A-X. Okay, so the first three equations, um, so the first two come from Newton's second law, and it says F12X plus zero 
plus r a x is equal to zero. And the second equation says f one two y minus uh, one hundred thousand plus r a y is equal to zero. And then the moment equation says 0.866 RAX minus 0.5 RAY is equal to zero. Uh, how many variables do we have so far? We have four variables. Three equations, so we can't do anything yet. So we'll just set these aside, come back to them. This is equation one, two, three. And now we'll isolate body two. Down here we have the reaction force RC. What's going on up here? So remember that uh, the pin, we assumed, we treated that like it was part of member one. So the pin isn't part of this one. So that 10,000 Newton force is not being applied to this at all. It's being applied to the pin. It only indirectly influences this through the contact force between the pin and this. So the only force this feels is the force on two by one, that force applied by the pin, and Newton's third law says that's equal to negative F12. Uh, um, I'll put the about point here. Um, okay, so first, this force negative F12, there's no row vector for that. Force vector is negative F12 X and Y. No moment. And then the force RC. Um, so that is... The row vector is negative, no, positive 0.5. Uh, negative 0.866. The force vector is RCX, RCY. And so the moment is 0.5 RCY plus 0.866. R, C, X. Um, so Newton's second law gives us fourth, fourth and a fifth equation. Equation four says negative F12 X plus R, C, X is equal to zero. The fifth equation says negative F12Y plus RCY is equal to zero. And the moment equation says 0 0.866 RCX plus 0 0.5 RCY is equal to zero. So now if we look at all six of these equations, how many variables do we have? Six, yep, we have um, RA, and that's a full vector. F12 is a full vector in RC. So we have six equations for six variables, 
now you know you can plug that into your calculator and solve it with reduced row echelon form. Yeah, uh, one's that big, you probably don't want to do by substitution. Okay, so uh, we should calculate that. Anybody have a PI eighty nine in front of them? Can I can I use it for a second? Okay, so here's what we got. Um, RA is equal to 2.89 times 10 to the fourth. Uh, wait, RA is a vector. So that's the X component. And 5 times 10 to the fourth. F12 is negative 2.89 times 10 to the fourth and positive 5 times 10 to the fourth. And RB is negative 2.89 times 10 to the fourth, five times 10 to the fourth. Yes, RC. Oh, and uh, the magnitude of all those, uh, so, R A magnitude is two point eight nine to the fourth. 5.78 times 10 to the fourth newtons. Okay, so hopefully we'll get the same thing when we use the truss simplification. Uh, they're all the same, you know, they all have the same components just flipped around. So what we're gonna see is that uh, well, magnitudes erase all the negatives. So um, what we're going to see is That's how it has to be for uh, for any two force bodies. Those forces have to be, if it's in equilibrium, then those forces have to be equal and opposite and along the line between the two joints. So let's just do the truss simplification real quick and make sure we get the same thing. Right. Simplification. Okay, so um, I'm just going to isolate this pin B. This is one, by the way, where the truss simplification saves you a ton of time. Not everything makes this big a difference, but this one makes a pretty big difference. But so we'll assume that there's tension from uh, member one. I'll call that F1. Tension from member two, call that F2, and then 100,000 newtons there. And we'll assume that that pin is a particle. So we'll just use Newton's second law. And we get um, so the force F1, that's uh, 
negative 0.5, negative 0.866 times F1. And this one is positive 0.5 F2, uh, negative 0.866 F2. plus zero, negative 100,000 is equal to zeros. Uh, so the first equation says F1 is equal to F2. And the second equation says uh, 1.732 F1 is equal to 100,000. So what's 100,000 divided by 1.732? Hopefully it's 5.78 times 10 to the fourth. Okay, 5.78 times 10 to the fourth Newtons. So in either case, um, what we got was one member like this, where these forces are 5.78 times 10 to the fourth. And this one over here, also in compression. Any questions about that calculation? OK, so test next time. And then on Monday, we'll get back to this. And we'll go from these calculations of the external loads to figuring out what the stresses and strains are.